One thing that never fails to amaze me is how quickly the EV world changes, the landscape changes and shifts. Hardly seems possible, it was four years that I started doing this job with Auto EV. And in that time, we've seen, well, battery technology's got a lot better, they're now more compact, um, charging speeds have gone up, the charging infrastructure, despite the tabloid press telling us otherwise, is now phenomenally good in some respects. I mean, I don't give that second thought, jumping in an electric car now and driving, you know, 350 miles to Scotland and 350 miles back. But four years isn't really a long time in the lifespan of a normal car. I mean, most manufacturers plan a model and they're out for usually about eight years or 10 years maybe, or with a sort of like a, a midlife facelift halfway through. But because the EV landscape changes so much, is four years too long to wait before giving an update? Well, to help me answer that question, I've got this, which is the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400. It's not a new model, it's not even a facelifted one. It's the same car that we road tested four years ago. But I want to know, is it still competitive four years on, given the fact there's now much newer competition? So, without further ado, welcome to an updated road test review of the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400. Welcome to a slightly grey day in Surrey. And of course, as always, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we go on with this week's updated road test review of the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400, it is of course that time where I'm going to ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you then you've pressed the little bell button that's down below, because then that way you'll be notified when our next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And of course, as always, please remember, leave us your comments down below as well. Let us know your thoughts on the cars that review, such as the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400, and of course on the OTV channel as a whole. So as I say, four years um, since we last road tested the Mercedes-Benz EQC and whilst <clears throat> the car hasn't been updated, our road test review has a little bit and I wanted to see, as I say, is the car still competitive? Because in that four years, we've seen quite a huge amount of cars enter this market space. BMW have had two, the iX3 and the iX. Uh, Audi's updated the Q8 e-tron. I mean, OK, we've still got the Jaguar I-Pace that we had way back then, um, but even it's had a little facelift. But we've seen new people enter the market space as well. Obviously, Genesis with the electrified uh, GV70 and, of course, Lexus now then there with the RZ450e. And we're going to see even more with people like Maserati with the new Grecali Fulgori, the Polestar 3, and of course his Porsche's new Macan. So, four years on, and given the fact that Mercedes-Benz themselves has actually given us new electric SUVs and the EQE SUV and EQS SUV, is the old EQC still cutting it? So, let's recap what the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400 is all about. Now, whilst it wasn't their first electric car, it was the first dedicated battery electric vehicle that Mercedes-Benz offered when it was launched back in 2019. It's based on the GLC piston-engined SUV, even though it only shares around 15% of that car's componentry. It has an 80 kWh battery with two motors offering all-wheel drive and a WLTP range of up to 254 miles. And it comes in three trim levels with prices ranging from just over £74,000 up to around £81,000 depending on which one of those you choose. But should you even choose it at all? Because as I say, there's a lot of new cars entered this market space since this car was launched back in 2019. Well the only way we're going to find out whether it's still worthy of your consideration or not is to put it through the updated and facelifted version of the Auto EV road test, the one that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric car. All right, styling. Well, four years on, how does it look? Well, I still can't make my mind up even from four years ago. There's bits of it I like and there's bits of it that I don't. I think it looks quite heavy at the front. I don't know if that's just me. 
it's just it's not quite, it's not really a kind of stylish looking car when you look at things like the Jaguar I Pace. I mean, okay, that is you know one of the best looking cars out there, I think. But even the Audi um, e-tron, the Q8 e-tron, is a really sharp looking car. The new Polestar 3, which I've just been to see this morning and filmed with, I've just obviously drove down there and that. And you know, when you put it next to this, oh yeah. But it's okay, it's not quite as bland looking as the new EQE and EQS with their kind of big swathes of plastic at the front. You do get some kind of pretense of a Mercedes-Benz grille there. And you get these chrome flashes that come out here because also they've done away with the base sport model that never used to get them. So they're all the kind of AMG line models now. You get your obligatory light bar that runs across the top and you get standard LED headlights which have got the kind of little blue kind of bits around the sides of them. Not a huge amount of fakery, in fairness, I say, although you don't actually need this grill, there is a radiator behind it, I can see, and of course most of the cooling's done down at the bottom there. And then these side vents here, well they're taking airflow round and pushing it round the wheels and then down the side of the car. Um, and of course you get your big prominent three-pointed star there, parking camera there, and of course Mercedes-Benz badge there. So yeah, I'm still not sure, if I'm honest. Hmm. Now, as you move around the side of the EQC, you can see that sort of more kind of traditional, understated Mercedes-Benz style. On the AMG line car, it's 20-inch alloys that are standard. When you move to the AMG line premium and AMG line premium plus, which this one is, you get 22-inch wheels. On this model, the, the, the premium plus model, they're done in gloss black with a polished outer. Uh, side running boards, they're standard across all the models, so that's quite nice. Gives you a little bit extra help getting in and out of the car, but it's not a particularly tall car. It's only 1.6 metres tall. I mean, you park it next to my Jeep Grand Cherokee and you can really see the difference in it. So, yeah... It, it's not a huge, huge, big SUV in that sense. Other than that, there's not really an awful lot to really see. I mean, as I say, you've got your kind of chrome bits of flash around there. Maybe it doesn't really help being in this kind of black colour, especially on a kind of grey day. Um, but yeah, it's not really an offensive car, but there's nothing really here to properly get you excited either. Around the rear of the car, well, light bar. Mercedes do love a light bar. The first one that had it, I think, on its, certainly on its EQ range, so there you go, that's that there. Um, rear spoiler kind of comes down, you get high level brake light inset, that inset there. Obviously nice fact, it's got a rear wiper. Um, your three-pointed star at the back doubles as, uh, not just the badge, but obviously it doubles as the boot release and the reverse camera. So when you click that open, it opens the boot and also when you go into reverse it pops and gives you a good view backwards. So that's quite decent. Um, and then just your badging really. And then that's it. Down the bottom, there's a kind of little kind of diffuser at the bottom to let airflow come up, and you get your reversing sensors there. A little bit of vents there. But other than that, yeah, as I say, it's not the most exciting car that Mercedes-Benz produced in terms of its styling. But in some ways, that's kind of Mercedes at the moment. As I say, they've kind of gone for that more kind of restrained, reserved look, and maybe that's what Mercedes-Benz customers like. What do you think? I mean, as I say, to me, it's, you know, an I-Pace and a Polestar 3 knock it out of the park um, as far as styling's concerned. And as I say, even the BMW iX is kind of uh, challenging as it is. At least it's a bit more interesting. And of course, Audi's Q8 e-tron. That's a really sharp looking car, I think, even after all these years. Is it a bit too bland now? As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Now, boot space is 500 litres, which, it's about the same size as the BMW iX. Well, it is the same size as the BMW iX. It's all right. It's, it's not as big as something like the Audi Q8 e-tron, even the Jaguar I-Pace is slightly bigger boot. But as you can see, you can certainly get the four auto EV suitcases in, plus a bit more space down the side for softer bags and such like. Um, you can extend the boot space up to 1,460 litres by dropping down the rear seats and they fold in a 40-20-40 split which is quite handy because obviously if you've got two rear passengers you want to put in a, um, a through a long load that's as ideal really and you just press these buttons here and then they just fold down so that extends up and obviously you've got you can take the uh, your thing out as well. Now there is some underflow storage and um, although you do get the two cable bags and um, for the cables they will fit underneath the boot floor and then also you get things like worn and triangles and they have a nice little kind of box that you can have so that it you can carry other sort of like bits and pieces in the back there and obviously you've got some tie down hooks in the back as well plus 
you get a 12 volt socket in the back but obviously there's no vehicle to to grid um, or vehicle to load socket and no three pin socket in the rear either um, there's no space up the front either so okay, it's dual motor but there's no storage space underneath the front bonnet though all right rear accommodation let's have a look um, not bad. I mean, the seat, the driver's seat has slid back, um, so that's not quite my driving position. It moves further back to let me out. So, if that's a taller driver, it's okay. You know, there's there's, there's room here for adults. There's a lot of foot room. There's plenty of foot room certainly underneath there, so that's not such a bad problem. And as I say, because you've got that sunroof that kind of goes in there, and not a panoramic roof. Um, it, this, the roof does kind of slope down, but it's scalloped out at the back, so there is headroom above me, um, and certainly if you were six foot, you'd probably be okay. However, transmission tunnel, no flat floor, so although it was Mercedes-Benz first dedicated EV, as I say, it's based on the GLC um, platform, so it, it, it has some compromises with that, and of course that's going to be one of them. So three people across isn't going to be ideal because you've got that big centre tunnel there. Um, storage. Cup holders. Ta -da! They come out like that. And we'll see if you're putting your water bottles in there. That's fine. And you've also got a little cubby in there where my daughter would no doubt hide pens and all sorts that would rattle around and drive me mad. Um, Isofix points really easy to to get to, so there and that's nice. They're just these kind of little rubberized things here that just you can just clip your Isofix seats into, so that's good. Door bins, they're quite shallow, but they will take a certain size of water bottle, so that's not too bad. And then you do get the kind of map pockets in the back there. If you flip down this little um, cubby, you've got two USB-C ports in there and a 12 volt socket, also a 12 volt socket for charging. And of course, you do get face vents, but no rear climate control. So again, bit of a mixed bag. It's all right. There's probably enough space for four of you to travel in, in relative comfort. Um, five is probably going to be a push unless it was a, a, a small, ch smaller child. And in terms of operating as a family car, you know, for two adults, two kids in the back, potentially. Then again, nice and easy access to, to Isofix points and connectivity for iPads and things. So good, good in some places not so good in others. Right, so like the exterior, the interior hasn't changed either. Um, not in some respects that it needed to because a lot of it works really very well. Mercedes-Benz have got, in my opinion, one of the nicest kind of layouts when it comes to this. And obviously people like um, Hyundai now with the Ionic models, the Ionic 5, the Ionic 6 Genesis uh, with the GV60, they follow a sort of similar pattern. You've got these kind of two screens here so they're both 10 and a quarter inch screens one in front of the driver and then obviously an infotainment screen you've got physical buttons as well across here is uh, across the, the the face here here and then obviously you've got some buttons obviously on the multifunction steering wheel and you get a trackpad um so what you have is both a touch screen so if you want to use it as a touch screen you can um you can just obviously do that and it's quite quick to respond that's quite nice um but what you can also do is you can also use this trackpad here to select what you want or for your passenger if you don't if you feel that's too much of a stretch and you get the you know it's um it's a capacitive uh trackpad so it clicks as you move it and obviously when you select something you know it, it actually just clicks in so i really like that it works well uh, just while i'm on that you get a nice what i like about it is that some of the little controls here they've got quite a nice kind of tactility to them so like for the volume of the radio, it just you've got this little roller scroll there, but there's also an say it's duplicated on the steering wheel as well, which is quite nice. And then your dynamic drive button um, for your your driving modes, um, there, that's the same. It's kind of mounted there, a little kind of toggle switch, which is quite nice. Um, and then, as I say, these physical buttons here, the kind of menu buttons here, you can use these um, to go in and then adjust all your kind of temperatures, such like as you see fit. So that's quite good. I like that bit of it. The dials are really, really clear, um, you know, in terms of uh, what you get in front of the driver and you can change the layout of them. So it's quite configurable within a certain amount. You've got three kind of styles you can have. You can have kind of sporty style, um, you can have classic style, and then you can have a kind of progressive style, which is a bit more modern and just the, the, um, the kind of numerals. You also get a head-up display. However, 
only when you move up the model ranges. And this is kind of a little bit um, where it all starts to kind of fall apart a little bit for me. There's three trim levels in the EQC model range. There's AMG Line, AMG Line Premium and AMG Line Premium Plus, which this particular car is. And you don't get things like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in the AMG Line car. Now, it still starts at £74,000, and you don't get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. You can, you have to buy it you know, as a separate thing. It's like 300 quid. It's not standard. And let alone that, it's not even wireless. You've got to plug it in. Wireless charging for your mobile? Not available at all. The head-up display? Only on the top two models. 360-degree parking camera? No, nope, you've got to have this AMG Line Premium Plus for that. It's just smacking a bit of being a bit stingy now, Mercedes, because stuff like that's now available on like 30,000, 35,000 pound cars. You know, come on, you know, it's, it, it should be standard. Things like that should be standard. I don't get why you can't have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in the base car. It's, it, I don't, don't get it at all. Um, the other things that I don't like about the interior is there's a real mix of materials in here and it's a mix of colours. The camera probably won't pick this up. So you've got this kind of grey, this black neoprene that's on the top of the doors and goes round the dash and down there, which is quite nice. But then you've got this grey kind of leatherette material here and then we've got some grey plastic here and then we've got kind of brown piping there. Then we've got piano black here leather on the seats but then wood grain on the doors and then this silver kind of trim that goes around it it's just too much there's just so much going on it's like they thought when they were designing the interior they thought what have we got in the box oh we've got all this whoa let's just use it it'll look cool it doesn't it's a real whilst the design is nice and the design works i do like this kind of fluted kind of grill section that goes up over the top of the dash it just looks like a bit of a mess with all the different colours and trims. It just looks odd. And then you get these kind of brown kind of, or I think they're supposed to be rose gold, but they look brown to me, um, bits in the air vents. Really, really odd. I don't get that. And this piano black down here is just, as I say, it's getting dusty. It's already getting scratched. Um, yeah, why have the wood grain up there, but then piano black gloss here? Wouldn't that be better doing it with the wood grain? Anyway, there you go. It doesn't have it. So it, that's the other thing that kind of irks me a little bit. But let's look at positives now. Let's look at the positives. The interior itself, in terms of its functionality, I think works particularly well. As I say, I like the dashboard. I like um, that you've also, as well as the touchscreen, the trackpad, you can use your voice recognition. Now, this uses Mercedes-Benz MBUX system. And I've got to say, apart from BMW's um, uh, eighth generation operating system, I think this is the best one. It's a really simple and easy one to use um, in terms of the way it recognises your voice and what you're asking it to do. Uh, it it recognises my accent, it works really, really well. Uh, and as I say, in terms of the layout and the way that everything is and the way that all these, kind of, it's not confusing a menu at all. I really like it and I think, as I say, apart from BMWs, this is still probably the best um, that I've used. So. Kudos to you there, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, right, what else have we got? Storage. Okay, as you can see, water bottle, coffee flask, two cup holders. Um, there's a little cubby in there, but as I say, it's not a wireless charging pad. Boo! Bad Mercedes, bad Mercedes. Let's get that back in there. And then as you see, you've got this kind of thing in here, which is where you put your phone because you've got to attach it to a cable, which goes in there. So at least you do charge your phone. Um glove box in there good sized door bins which are also shaped to take bottles as well so there's plenty of storage for stuff like that driving position absolutely excellent really really nice comfortable car i like these seats um these particular ones they've got the electrically adjustable squab at the front that comes out electrically adjustable um head restraint three position sorry three position memory as well on the on both front seats so that's good Heated seats, but no ventilated seats. Thought you might have had that on by now, Mercedes, but there we go. Steering wheel, pleasingly kind of round. Slightly flattened off at the bottom, but nice three-spoke. And again, although two of the little trackpad things are 
touch sensitive, they do click as you move them. So they're not as bad to use as uh, Volkswagen's controls. And then the rest of the controls are actual physical buttons. So that works particularly well, and I do like that. Typical Mercedes-Benz, everything's grouped on the one column stock. It's not this great big thing that I used to have on my old Mercedes-Benz 190, but you've got, um, you know, you turn it for the wipers, which is quite nice. Um, and then you've got your rear wiper on there, and then obviously it's your indicator stock and uh, main beam lights as well. This other column stock over here is your gear selector. Um, so again, all within nice, easy reach. Two paddles behind the steering wheel to alter your brake regeneration. Uh, we'll talk about that when we're driving it because again that works particularly well and then down on this like in front of my knee i've got my light switch electronic part brake and then your usual suspects grouped on the door so as i say it's a sort of mixed bag in here for me is like like the styling on the outside plus points it's comfortable um, the user interface is really easy to use um, and slick and just works well um, the driver interface that you get here again is, is configurable enough you can you know have you can have your navigation in the center you can have your media in the center like you come with a lot of cars now but you can also change the layout of the dials if you want so that's all good um, things that are not so good um, as I say the mismatch of materials and colors I don't know what's going on don't particularly like that um, as I say some of the qualities no look that's not that shouldn't be happening on a Mercedes Benz as far as I'm concerned that plastic bit there is a bit rubbish the other thing that I do have an issue with um, with regards to this is with the um, when you do have the Apple CarPlay on although you've got a ten and a quarter inch screen when you put the Apple CarPlay on it comes in oh, it comes in to be um, take up a much smaller space so I don't know why that is. It doesn't occupy the whole real estate of the screen. Has this got gesture control? I don't know if it does or not. Well, maybe it does. Um, it doesn't occupy the whole um, thing of the screen, which is a bit odd. So it really brings it down into this narrow little window. I don't like that either. It should be a nice big wide screen, considering it is a 10 and a quarter inch screen. Um, so as I say, that's not so good. And as I say, the lack of standard equipment um, and the lack of just being able to option things up, you've got to move up the range to get things. So if you wanted an AMG line car, but you particularly wanted head-up display, you can't just have that as an option. You've got to buy a higher spec model, which again, I find a bit stingy. The only other thing that I will say, and again, it's just a personal choice. I'm not going to sing a Mercedes. It has a sunroof, but it's a standard size sunroof. They don't get the option of a panoramic roof in the EQC. So as I say, mixed bag, some of it works really, really well. As I say, in terms of using it, I like the way it works. Um, it's very comfortable. Um, it's very easy to live with. But as I say, quality's not so good. As I say, this weird mismatch of colours and materials, not so good, and lack of standard equipment. So, yeah, falling behind a little bit on that bit, Mercedes. Now, the EQC 400 is an 80 kilowatt hour battery. And that should give, according to WLTP figures, a range of up to 254 miles. Now that's on the car when it has the 20-inch the, um, the wheels. Now, I had the car the other day and I went on uh, the launch of the, the, the Abarth 500e and, and that was a good long trip I had. It was about 95% full and it was showing me a range of just under 200 miles. Sorry, 90% full, it was showing just under 200 miles. So I would suggest a real world range is probably going to be somewhere 210, 220 miles. Um, depending on the outside conditions. Now, a friend of mine actually has an EQC 400, and through the summer, that's roughly what he's getting. In winter, it does drop below that 200-mile bracket. So, it, it, you know, there are cars that are better than it, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, charging speeds, that's the other issue you've got. 110 kilowatts is the maximum charging speed that it will take, uh, meaning the benchmark, uh, 10 to 80%, actually takes 40 minutes, not the usual 30 that you get with some of the car's rivals, and more than double the time it takes the Genesis electrified GV70 to do it, because it will charge up from 10 to 80%, 18 minutes, if you can find a charger fast enough to fill that car up. So, again, not ideal. If you're charging um, from full, uh, sorry, from zero to full on your seven kilowatt wall box, then you're probably looking at around about 11 hours. But if you do have an 11 kilowatt wall box, the car will take that as an onboard 11 kilowatt charger, and that time will drop to around about seven and a half hours. Now, we've seen a lot of competition, as, as I keep saying all the way through this video, since the, um, 
the EQC was launched. Um, so, so like big power figures. Tesla's just gone by, for instance. You know, the big power of, you know, the Teslas and the, sort of, the hundreds of horsepower, you know, sort of like big SUVs that you get nowadays. You know, 408 brake horsepower that this, this car produces probably now doesn't seem, well, that special in some respects. It's 760 newton metres of torque, and that'll allow the car to dispatch the 0 to 60 sprint in 5.1 seconds. So, you know, in terms of raw figures, it's still quite sprightly. What, what I'll say, however, is, because we're now used to the performance of these kind of electrified EV, these electrified SUVs, as I say, it doesn't feel as neck snapping as 5.1 seconds would have done in a big car like this 10 years ago, for instance. So we are kind of used to that. But don't take that as read as me still like saying this isn't uh, an unenjoyable car, because it is. There's a lot to like about the way the EQC drives still. Um, even to this day. Now, I'm quite fortunate, you know, obviously doing this job I get. I get cars to, you know, evaluate, you know, to, to put on the um, to put on the channel. But um, I use these cars. I use them as my everyday cars. And as I say, I've had a really busy week this week. Um, I've been at the Abarth uh, launch. So my home in Surrey, I had to go up to Gloucestershire. You know, it was a two and a half hour drive, two and a half hours back. Um, you know, motorway, you know, back roads like this. I've been at Goodwood, you, you know, so you know, which is you know, sort of like fifty odd miles from my home, you know, and then back again. So, you know, I've been using the car just as a tool. And I mean, I know that sounds an awful thing to say, using a, you know, an eighty-one thousand pound car as a tool, but that's effectively what I've been doing. And the one thing I'll say about the Mercedes Benz is the one. Um, sort of like, you know, the one thing I've noticed with this is how easy it is to use, how easy it is to just to get in and just you know get on with the job. So as I say, as much as it might sound like a derogatory term, and I genuinely don't mean it to sound as such, it, it, it is a very good car for just doing that, for just getting on with being a car. It's a very comfortable car. Um, the drive up to Gloucestershire the other day, as I say, was a real mixture of roads. Um, you know, and it was an early start, and you know, Goodwood's been an early start, and all the rest of it. These seats, they do hold you up. There's a good range of adjustment in them, as I say. You can adjust the length of the squab in these electrically. They've got nice lateral support. The bolsters are just right um, for me. They're, they're really, really nice seats. Um, so I have to say, um, it's been excellent in terms of comfort. The driving position itself is superb. Electronically adjustable steering column, so just for reach and rake as well. And obviously you can program that into your memory settings. So very, very good in terms of driver comfort. It's been excellent. You, there's, um, there's also been a lot, of, um, a lot to recommend in terms of its refinement as well. You know that I do like a nice refined car on, on a longer drive. The only thing I will say on these 22-inch alloys, Certainly on sort of like course on motorway surfaces, you do get a little bit more road roar um, than you maybe would at, say, something like a BMW iX, um, you know, in the Lexus RZ 450e. So, uh, and it's not it's not uncomfortable. It's just that you do notice it because they say those other cars are so quiet. So that's the one thing that I would say, you know, in terms of that. Um, ride quality, ride quality is all right. Um, again, it's not. It's not best in class, um, certainly not the worst. Um, you do tend to notice it if a wheel drops into, like you know, like a pothole or a manhole cover. Um, it does make itself known. Again, we'll attribute some of that to the 22-inch wheels on the AMG line Premium Plus car. This is, um, but yeah, it, you know, it can do with maybe a little bit better spring and damper uh, tuning, as far as I'd be concerned, to make it a truly. Um, you know, comfortable car in that sense. But see, it's not uncomfortable, but you do notice these imperfections on the road surface. Steering's okay. The steering's quite nice. I, I do quite like the steering on the car. It, so the wheel's quite a nice size. Um, it's got a nice hole. It's not too thick. You know, like you get some of the BMWs that are a bit thick. The Tesla wheels are really kind of that kind of real thickness to them that I don't like. Um, this is quite nice. Um, it's not as quite as thin as the Audis. It's about right. You know, it's that kind of Goldilocks style steering wheel. It's about right. You get the little kind of perforated bits at the side. And it's say unlike the Volkswagen with the touch sensitive controls, the touch sensitive controls in the Mercedes are way in on the spoke, so you never really hit them by mistake, um, which is a good thing in that sense. Visibility's good. 
um, rear visibility is all right. It's quite a, it's quite a shallow rear window, um, and it's quite a dark cab in this. Um, so you're over the shoulder visibility. There is a rear uh, three quarter light. Um, at the back so you do see it but some of the pillars are quite thick and the seats are quite big so you just got to watch occasionally when you're kind of coming out of you know sort of like one of those kind of slanted kind of junctions you just got to watch that there isn't a car because there's a blind spot right there with that big pillar if I look round that's all I can see is that pillar um, safety systems well there's a there's a lot on the car um, that you get so um, you obviously get things like lane keep assist um, as you'd expect, and again, it's not too intrusive, it's just nice, you just get that little kind of, you can just feel the wheel kind of pulling you back into line, so there's no audible warning. That's the other thing I do like about it, there's none of those beeps and bongs that you get from those other cars um, that we've been testing recently, so, you know, well done Mercedes for leaving them off, I do like that. I want to talk about the brakes a little bit now. Um, the brakes, they're all right. The... Um, they, they take a bit of getting used to, and they're not in a bad sense. They're not like the Stellantis brakes, but just as you push, there's just a tiny, tiny. It does, you, it does start to take, um, but not maybe as sharp as you might think that it would. So you have to kind of push through a little bit further, um, and then you can then feel it, 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 the pedal kind of, you know, s you know, really grips and kind of slows the car down. The brake regeneration, however, is very good. Um, it's adjustable via the two paddles, like you get with things like Hyundai and Kia. Um, so you can take it completely off. So there's there's two stages of it off. Um, there's two stages of it on. Or what you can do is you press and put, sorry, you pull and hold on the right hand paddle, and it goes into an auto mode, which is excellent. It, it really is very good. So it's using the forward facing camera. Now, there's a lot of these cars have it. It's not just Mercedes. But this is a particularly good one. I do like this one. Um, and as you're getting close to the car in front, it'll just say, right, enough's enough, and it'll pull you back. Or it knows you're coming up to a roundabout and things if you're using the, the, um, the, the you know, the, the, the satellite navigation. And again, it will pull it. It's one of the things I do find with some of the cars I've been driving late, especially when I've been doing the long trips up to Scotland. If you put on the cruise control and as you're kind of coming up behind the car, even if you're a safe distance back and you, you go to pull out, it starts to apply the brakes a little bit too quickly and then obviously it slows you down as you're doing the overtake. It feels really weird. The Mercedes doesn't do that. It blends it really nicely. So that's the one thing I do like about um, you know this car. I'd say the regen is very good on it and it's, it, it's sharp enough. Um, for most tastes. Is it true one pedal driving? Probably not, um, but it's okay. Um, again, as I say, I'm a firm believer in, you know, if you're sat in this side of the car behind a steering wheel, you should be driving, the car shouldn't be doing it for you. So yeah, so again, all's well in that book. So you're probably kind of getting the impression from, and I hope you are, that it's good. It's mostly good. There's not really a sort of like a bad facet to the drive of the car. It's still like it was four years ago. But because other cars have now come onto the market, because some of them are so good at what they do, you see that? Just over that little bump, you could really feel that bump there. That's what I mean. It sits, it's now sitting somewhere in the middle of the class. One thing I will say about this car is that if you've come from, a bit like I did with the Toyota, the BZ4X, if you've come from a Mercedes-Benz, if you have a, I don't know, a C-Class or an E-Class or an M-Class or whatever, and you think to yourself, well, I think I'm going to go electric, this will be a very easy transition for you in terms of the way the functionality of the car and the way it tends to drive. There's a nice weight behind the car as well. It doesn't feel, it, it is heavy, but it doesn't feel too heavy, if that makes sense. It's a solidity that you get in a Mercedes-Benz that, you know, Mercedes-Benz drivers do like, Mercedes-Benz owners do like, and that's what I mean. Where it starts to uh, suggest, um, dare I suggest, fall apart a little bit is in the dynamics. I always think it's a really odd thing, you know, when they use this term sports utility vehicle, SUV, because this isn't a sporty car. Now, it, it is quick in the sense, as I say, not to 60 in 5.1 seconds, it's fast, you know, in anybody's book, but it doesn't particularly enjoy 
going fast, if that makes sense. Um, and it just feels a little bit out of its depth in that sense. You take a Jaguar I-Pace, for instance, that's a very dynamic car, but again, the way the car looks, it doesn't give the impression of that being that big, tall SUV-like vehicle, like the Mercedes, like the Audi, like the BMW. So, yeah, it, it the sporting side of SUV doesn't really apply here as far as I'm concerned. Once you go past a certain limit, the EQC starts to struggle a little bit now. Uh, but again, it's not designed for that. And as I say, that's where I feel that terminology, SUV, is a very misleading terminology. Um, let's talk about the handling and then we'll call it a day in terms of that. So the handling's Again, it's okay. As I said, I like the steering. There's a, a decent sort of weight behind the steering. If you do sort of like a lane change, like I'm, you know, a kind of chicane style lane change there, you know where the wheels are pointing. That's absolutely fine. But there is an element now, obviously, of body roll, which you can feel. And as I say, the car does kind of, kind of lurch a bit like that. So you do feel it a little bit more. Um, and once you kind of up the speed on that, that's when you really feel it. The car just starts to kind of, I'm not saying it's a wallery old hell, Herbert, but you know what I'm saying. It just, it's not in its comfort zone at all. Where it works really, really well in my book is that kind of, you know, the longer motorway drives like I was doing the other day. You go onto a motorway, certainly one that's maybe got a, sort of like a nicer surface on it. You know, you stick the cruise control on, you revel in the comfort of the car, and that's what it's good at. You make any pretense at trying to throw it down the back road you're not going to enjoy it now there are driving modes with the car that's the last thing I do need to talk about and these are these, this, this dynamic button down here a little kind of scroll wheel here so let's just have a look at those so there's four, there's eco as you'd expect um, from eco we go to comfort which I have been driving the car in pretty much for the whole week I have to say um, sport and it comes up and says, not with roof load. And it gives you a little picture of a car with a slash going through it, saying you can't use it with roof load. Okay, so when you go into the, sort of the sport mode, you obviously, everything kind of sharpens up a little bit. Steering doesn't get weightier, or certainly doesn't feel it to me. It feels exactly the same steering as, you know, I've been driving around in. But the throttle resp response is a lot sharper. Um, and you put your foot down and you can really sort of like feel the car just kind of sprint off. But again, as I say, it's not that kind of neck snapping um, performance that we've seen from some of these cars. Uh, and actually, I think that's a good thing because it feels... If this is going to sound odd, I apologise, but try, bear with me on this. It feels like a decent kind of internal combustion engine throttle. Obviously, it's instant. The torque is there, and it just pushes you forward. It pushes you back a bit in the seat. But it's not that whoa, and everything explodes um, that you get with some cars. The the mapping of the setting is very good. So as I say, once you kind of get your foot down and you kind of push it, it gathers speed it gains momentum, it doesn't thrust you forward to the horizon in an uncontrollable fashion. So whilst you do notice the difference between comfort and sport, um, it's not, if you were to think about it like, you know, sort of like the kind of performance you would get from say like an AMG V8 engine Mercedes, it's like that. It's that kind of, you know, you know you're in control of it and you know it's going to happen. Now interestingly enough, talking of control, most of the time the EQC, although it's dual motor, is actually, it's the front motor that's doing the work and the rear only comes in, you know, under sort of like hard acceleration or it detects grips being lost and that's to aid it with efficiency. And talking of efficiency, today's been pretty decent actually. Um, I charged it when I was down filming with the Polestar and it charged up to about, I don't know what it was, it was saying I had a range of about 110 miles and I've probably done you know, sort of like 40 if not 50 odd miles and it's staying I've got now on nearly 70 left so it's kind of recalculating it depending how I'm driving it and actually it's been it's been good uh, you know so although the car isn't the best in terms of what it's capable uh, what's capable in the class and its charging speed isn't the best its efficiency is all right if you behave yourself so yeah summary it's good it's not the best, it's certainly not the worst. Now as I say, there's just three trim levels. 
in the EQC 400 range now. So the AMG line kicks the range off at £74,275. So there's no base sport model now, so that's your lead into the range, 75 large. Um, you move up to the AMG line premium, which is just a tickle under £79,000, or this AMG line premium plus, which is just over £81,000. Although as tested, this car is about £82,000 because it has um, the metallic black paint. Um, and these prices obviously correct at time of filming. Now, warranty-wise, it's still just the three years um, that you get with the Mercedes-Benz product. So they are, again, some of the European manufacturers are really falling behind, especially the Korean manufacturers, you know, with a seven-year warranties. And, of course, even Lexus um, offer you that ability to take up to 10 years worth of warranty on the car. Although one thing I will say is, if you do buy the Mercedes-Benz, again, at time of filming, you do get the first year's Ionity charging thrown in with that price. And in terms of competition, well, it's kind of why we've, we've kind of revisited the EQC 400, as I said at the start. It's that competition that's come out since this car was launched that you've now got to consider as tr true rivals to this car. And of course, one of the biggest ones is Audi, because the e-tron was launched at a very, very similar time to this. But Audi have updated it into the Q8 e-tron, a car we road tested a few, uh, a few weeks back. Um, Jaguar's I-Pace, it's still around and it's still a brilliant car um, in terms of its dynamics and the way it looks and even just the way it actually behaves and it's easy to live with. So it's still around and it's still a real sort of like um, true competitor for this car. But of course the traditional Mercedes-Benz rival BMW, they've effectively got two cars that sort of straddle this. So you can go slightly cheaper but the same size with the iX3 um, or you can go slightly bigger um, for the same price with the iX, certainly in its xDrive 40 guys. Yeah, it's a challenging car to look up, but it does drive well, and it, it, it certainly looks a lot more modern than the Mercedes-Benz. certainly has a lot more modern tech. Uh, two new competitors into the, this market space, of course, are Genesis with their electrified GV70, um, and of course Lexus with the RZ450e. A car, both cars we've tested, both cars have the, you know, they have the plus points, they have the negative points, I do like both of them to drive in fairness and I say in terms of Genesis I think it's Mercedes that they're really kind of gunning for with, with that GV70. Um, there's another couple of cars that we've mentioned uh, in this as well and we do keep mentioning them but I've now seen the Maserati uh, Gricali Folgori at Goodwood this, uh, in the last couple of days and it's a good looking car in some respects. Obviously we're going to have to wait to drive it to see what it's like in terms of the rest of the competition there, but Maserati, they are pushing their brand back up, they're trying to give the kudos back to the Trident badge, and I think they could be real players in the market, so watch this space. And of course Porsche with the Macan, the new Macan that's coming, um, again we keep mentioning it in every road test of these premium badged SUVs, but given how good the Taycan is, I expect the Macan to be in there with a shout as well. So there's certainly plenty of other cars to consider when you're looking at the EQC 400. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Mercedes-Benz EQC 400. We like its comfort. The MBUX driver interface is still one of the class's best. It's still a very nice car to drive in some respects. And it's still relatively decent when it comes to interior space, even though it's not a dedicated EV platform we don't like. Well, we started to think that it offers poor value for money, especially in the fact that it lack of some of the equipment in some trim levels. Some of the interior materials are starting to let the side down, and its range and charging capabilities are now falling behind class best. So, the EQC 400 from Mercedes-Benz. Is it still relevant four years on? Is it still up there with the best in class? Because four years ago, I really did like the car. I thought it drove quite well. I thought it was, you know, nice interior. I, th I thought, you know, the MB UX user interface, which was brand new then, was dead easy to use. And I got on really, really well with it. And it's very, very comfortable. And in some respects, it's exactly the same as today. It's still a nice car to drive. It's still roomy enough for dare to suggest most people's needs and I still get on very well with that kind of user interface but in those four years as back then there really was just this the iPace and the e-tron to consider as I say four years in the EV world is a massive shift and we're now seeing cars which are a lot more modern a lot more technologically advanced and I say certainly when it comes to batteries range efficiency and charging speeds and as I say the charging network despite what the the, the tabloid press will tell you 
is actually getting a lot better and it will continue to do so. There's a lot to like about this car and I have to say I've found it a very very easy car to live with. I've been doing quite a lot with this car this week. I've been to press launches, I've been up and down to Goodwood in it because obviously it's the, good, the Festival of Speed Week and we're doing some work there. So it has been put through sort of like the paces and as an everyday car just to get in and jump in and drive it's still pretty decent. Is it best in class? No, no, far from it. But is it the worst? Not really. If you're a Mercedes-Benz driver and you're looking to go electric, you'll go on well with this car. If you're coming into this market space for the first time, there are now better cars out there than this. Thank you for watching another episode of um, Auto EV and thank you for putting up with this like kind of grey and damp conditions in a very, very dirty car. But as I say, it's been put to work this week. Um, remember, um, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. And then once you've done that, press the bell button that's down below because then you'll be notified when our next video goes live. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. And as I say, please remember, leave us your comments down below. Do you have an EQC 400? Let me know how you're getting on with it. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Do you think it's st is it still a car you'd go and buy today? Um, or would you change, if you, were, if you have one and you were going to upgrade it, would you go for something different? Let me know why. Now also remember we're on across all social media platforms as well, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and TikTok, so please give us a follow there too because that helps us as well. And if you're just, you know, if you've enjoyed the video and you want to see even more from us here at Auto EV, then stick on the YouTube channel, there's well over 140 videos now, it's not just road test reviews but used car buying guides, uh, electric icons, uh, motorbike reviews, van reviews, even twin tests as well. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching. As I say, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for continuing to support the channel. I'll see you again soon.